da, 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 da. hey, da, 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 da. ladies and gentlemen, CocoSports.com proudly presents Five Stars or Better. This is our weekly podcast where Dave Coco and myself, we review all the matches that professional wrestling journalist Dave Meltzer ranked, well, five stars or better. And, of course, I want to introduce my tag team partner in crime, Dave Coco. What's up, brother? Hey, not that much, man. What's up? Hey, it's been a great day. It's been a great day. You know, we're going to go back to Japan here. I know we, I, we're we working our way down, and we're still in the 80s here. And uh, this week, we've landed on, believe it or not, another All Japan match uh, from January 28th, 1986. It's uh, Jobo Suruta and Jinichiro Tenru versus Riki Chushu and Yoshisha, Yoshihaki, Yoshihiki, I could have sure worked on this, Yatsu, I apologize if I mispronounced it, I'm not being disrespectful, it's just my Japanese is beyond horrible. So, that's the tag team match here, and it was at New Year's, New Year's War Super Battle. And uh, Coco, I'm going to say off the bat here, this is not the first really big tag team match we've had here uh, on our podcast, but it's definitely one of the better ones here. Just, you know, just kind of like initial thoughts before I kind of get in the background. Um, this is the most all Japan, all Japan match I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> mm-hmm. if, if you could describe all Japan in one match, this would be it. Um, and also all the big events. If you are a combat sports fan, fighting, mixed martial arts, pro wrestling, you have to come around Christmas and New Year's. From one four, from Christmas to one four, it is the best fights, matches, anything combat sports going. So, um, yeah, around this time is, you know, this time of year is when Japan has its biggest events. All right, now Coco, now I'm going to talk about all four men going into this in, into this match to kind of where they were to kind of set the stage for you. So I'm going to start. Uh, obviously, I feel like I need to start with uh, Jumbo Saruta. Now, Jumbo Saruta, at this point, was a big star. Uh, he was like the number two guy only behind Giant Baba, who was just just their top guy. They're just, uh, he was the bees. He was like their Hulk Hogan. And so he was in trying to make comparison here. This would be like, Jumbo Saruta would basically kind of be like the Macho Man. Saw the number two. It's just, and he was a big draw. So a little bit about him. He actually trained in Amarillo, Texas, of all places, under Dory Funk Jr., somebody that we featured early on uh, under All Japan Match. We did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and he got his name. His name was originally when he went into uh, the Texas Territory. He was called Tommy Saruta, but they kind of thought that that was uh, too effeminate of a name. So they had a fan contest about, you know, what should his name be, and the name Jumbo won, and it winded up sticking. So he was then became Jumbo Saruta. So basically the same way the 70s picked their expansion teams in sports is the same way they, that he found his name. Exactly. Uh, and he was already an established star because he had won the AWA title from Nick Botwinkle in 1984 in February in Tokyo. Now, granted, that uh, title reign did not last long. It only lasted until that May when he lost to Rick Martel. Uh, he had an amazing background. Uh, he, he was just very active. Uh, he had won the All Japan Amateur Wrestling Championship in 71 and 72. He competed in the 1972 Olympics. I, I don't believe he medaled, but who cares, dude? You, you made the Olympic team. You competed in... In the, in the Olympics, man, the best of the best. Uh, he was actually scouted by uh, Baba, and he actually won the Champions Carnival, which is uh, all Japan's uh, you know biggest uh, tournament of the year. He had actually won it in the in 1980, and then also he was part of the World's Strongest Tag Determination League. He had won that in 1978 and 1980 with Giant Baba as his partner. He was a former NWA United National uh, Champion, heavyweight champion. Uh, he'd won at 76, 77, 80, 81, and 82, and was also the, uh, had uh, arranged the NWA International Heavyweight Champion in 1983. So this is, again, this is where we're shaping up here. Now, his partner, Jinchiro Tenru, he had actually started wrestling, it was actually sumo wrestling at the age of 13. 
and then he was also scouted, and then he also went to Amarillo to train because all Japan had had a uh, working relationship with the NWA. So when you hear stories about uh, you know Bot Winkle coming over, the Von Erichs going over, this is why they kind of went uh, back and forth is because they had this working deal. And so he had debuted in 1976, and then by 1984 had won the he had won the NWA United National Heavyweight Championship. So he had won it uh, a couple of years after, uh, at that point, Saruta had held it. Now, on the other side, you've got Ricky Chushu. Now, this guy's life was just fascinating. I think you could almost make a movie out of this guy's life. He was, and, uh, This is going to come into play here, so this is why I'm bringing this up. He was actually half Korean. I believe his father was uh, Korean, his, his mother was Japanese, and because of that, uh, you know, he faced some discrimination, some racial discrimination in his life. And I'll show you, I'll tell you how this comes into play. Um, can, you know, I, can I just, can I just add something real quick? Boom, boom. Yeah, um, I'm a university teacher, high school teacher, teacher of all types. I know I curse a lot on the YouTubes, but you know, sometimes I clean up and teach, teach the children. Um, that still happens to today. Um, in, in a lot of uh, schools, if you're Japanese, you're not picked on as much. If you're a foreigner, you're not picked on that much. But if you're mix, they call them halfies. And, you know, some people live in denial that, like, that's not a problem. It's still a huge problem today. Well, thank you. Uh, I hate that that's still going on, but... He had actually, uh, going through school, he had actually did judo and amateur wrestling. In fact, he actually made uh, the Japanese Olympic team for wrestling, but Japan wouldn't let him compete. He was going to go to the 1972 Olympics, also, you know, with uh, Jumbo Surya, but he couldn't, but they wouldn't, Japan, the nation, wouldn't let him compete because, you know, they're basically making the argument that maybe, he, you know, he really wasn't, you know, because he was only half Japanese. Yeah, so, this is very common throughout history. So, but here's what happened. South Korea got on the phone with him and said, yeah, we'll take you. So he actually competed uh, in the Olympics, but he, but he represented South Korea instead. So that was interesting. And he had also won the All Japan Championships in Freestyle and Roman Greco uh, in 1973. Uh, he was already lauded as a... Um, is a is a great pro wrestler by this time. He'd won the Fighting Spirit Award from Tokyo Sports in 1979. He was also awarded the Match of the Year in 1983 against Tetsumi Fujinami, and again in 1984 against uh, Antonio Inoki, and then also with this, also with one of his opponents here, Jumbo Saruta, in uh, 1985. So he was, you know, Chushu knew, knew what he was doing, and he also invented. Uh, Basically, what we know today is the Scorpion Deathlock or the Sharpshooter. He invented that move. So that's one big, that's a huge accomplishment here. Anyway, his tag tag team partner, and I'm going to try this one more time. And again, if I botch this, I apologize. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. It's just my Japanese is horrible. Uh, Yoshiaki uh, Yatsu. Now, again, he was another Olympic athlete. He competed in the 1976 Summer Olympics. And uh, from 1976 to 1986, he had won first place finishes. He had actually made the 1980 Olympic team, but he did not compete because the that year the um, the Olympics was being held in Moscow, so some countries, uh, Japan and the United States were among the countries that boycotted uh, the Olympics because it was being held in Moscow. The whole Soviet Union thing, the Cold War, communism. Let's just leave politics for a different day. Uh, he was actually in New Japan. And he left with Choshi for uh, All Japan in 1984. Uh, and he is also was a world-class championship wrestler. Again, remember the association with the NWA here. He was their television champion, and uh, he won that in February of 1983. So those are the four. So those are the four men. Now, let's give you, I'm going to go, go through my notes here. This was... Let me give you the setup here for it. This was like an invasion storyline. Because what had happened at this time was 
there was it was right around 1984. Uh, Ricky Chushu had come back from excursion in 1982. Hang on, let me make sure let me check my dates here. Yeah, okay. So anyway, he had come back from excursion in Mexico in 1982, and the storyline was that he would find out that Tatsumi Fujinami was being pushed as the number two. This is in New Japan, by the way. So he comes back to he was working for New Japan. He goes to Mexico for excursion, which is you know pretty much the standard. Comes back, and storyline is he's upset that Tatsumi Fujinami, somebody who was younger than him was being pushed as a number two guy in New Japan behind Antonio Inoki. And so Ricky Chushu formed a heel unit called uh, Ishingun. Uh, it, it translates to Revolutionary Army. And the idea was they were going to feud with Inoki and Tatsumi Fujinami through 1983 and 84. But this is where they basically a work turned into a shoot. Because it really did after a while got to the point where, you know, uh, Chushu felt like he was being uh, disrespected. And just when the um, feud between them and Fujinami and Anoki was heating up, the entire, um, the entire uh, faction right there bolted and they formed their own wrestling promotion called Japan Pro Wrestling. And, so basically, uh, let me try to put it in modern day terms. Remember when uh, they, when New Japan put uh, Suzuki Goon, they sent them on excursion to Pro Wrestling Noah. And so they invaded Pro Wrestling Noah. They ran rough shot through that promotion, were eventually vanquished, and they all went back to New Japan. It was something similar to that, but it was for, but this was for real because they got pissed off at New Japan's booking, formed their own. Um, their own uh, company called Japan Pro Wrestling, and they immediately started working with all Japan uh, talent. So they were doing their own shows, but they were, again, working with all Japan, and they were working on separate contracts. And eventually they just kind of came up with the idea of, well, you know, let's turn this into a story. So they have, that leads to this match right here in 86. So Coco, uh, I've laid out the ground. I've laid out the groundwork here. So let's get into the actual match. Um, before we get into the match, I just want to say something. Giant Baba was a huge star because he pitched mm-hmm. for the Tokyo Giants, and when he came over, like it was like combining sports fans and wrestling fans. Um, you know, nowadays it's more common, but back then that was huge. Um, the Tokyo Giants are the New York Yankees of Japan, but I feel like they're bigger. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I think the Tokyo Giants in Japan are bigger than the Yankees in America. Um, So, you know, he was a huge star in baseball, comes over to pro wrestling, and he wasn't the best in ring work, but he was a crazy huge star. And in Japan, this still goes on to today, um, the old Bender promotions, <laughs> like pretty much everything's a Bender promotion. New Japan, All Japan, Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, Wrestle One. You the list goes on all day. There's so many promotions in, in uh in Japan, and it goes like this. Well, we're gonna book you like this. Well, screw you. I'm gonna start my own promotion with Blackjack and Hookers. You know what I mean? Except they don't forget about the promotion, and. In some ways, it's good because there's so much pro wrestling. But if you think America or Florida or the WWE program's oversaturated, it's insane how oversaturated it is in uh, in Japan. And the thing is, too, like if you can just if you're an indie wrestler, if you could just arrive here, you can make it in a company. Because there's so many companies, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's so many dojos. There's a place um, right outside, you know, right outside. Uh, it's in Tokyo, but, man, I forget what it's based. It's kind of famous, and I apologize for not knowing the name. They run four to five shows every weekend, 
but one or two every weekday. They just constantly have shows because they have a they have a building. They're like, okay, well, any any wrestling company <coughs> you can come in here. And the problem is, especially like if you're a pro wrestling fan, like if you're a pro wrestling fan in Florida, New York, or some of the hotbeds for indie wrestling, you know what I mean? You could see them all. I remember coming to Tokyo. I'm like, man, I'm gonna follow everything. And they're like, cool, cool, cool. There's 22 shows this weekend. And you're like, good God. But, yeah, it's crazy that New Japan and All Japan started just like that. All right, back to you, Booms. All right, so let's get into the actual match. Uh, they welcomed in the challengers first. They actually got a pretty decent pop there, and they were wearing the uh, red and white windbreakers. And the reason I bring that up is because red and white, the windbreakers, was pretty much very similar to what um, – New Japan was wearing at the time. Now remember, this is like these are technically like the invaders. They're they're their own company, but it's a fact. But it's a New Japan faction. You know, now in all Japan pro wrestling, and then out come the champions. Um, both, uh, both uh, Tenru and Saruta, You know, championship belts. They got a big pop there. Uh, they. They start the bell, and then it just turns into a hoss fight immediately. We're talking uh, a lot of chops, punches, and kicks. Uh, they start working each over each other over. Uh, Jinjiro Tenru, he was got worked over in the corner. You know, the the champions are immediately put on you know put on their heels. He's getting double teamed. He even gets caught with a, a spiked pile driver. Uh, the you know the crowd starts chanting here. They get, actually did a spot where they did like basically dual figure fours. I don't know how it's possible, but they managed to put figure fours on each other. Both uh, I think it was Yatsu and uh, Ten, Tenru. Uh, they eventually went to the uh, break. Went to the outside. They started working over uh, Tenru. Uh, Jumbo comes back in. He's taking it to the challenger. He's laying some pretty stiff shots there. Him and Shoshi had a hell of a match on this one here. Uh, and eventually they started isolating uh, Choshu. Uh, they worked. Uh, uh, they were working like he had a rib injury. They had, he had uh, his, his ribs were heavily taped, and so they started working on that with the cobra twist and elbowing in there. Uh, they had some parts where they were teasing. And this is another thing I liked about the match is when one guy really got in trouble, his partner had no trouble going in there and breaking it up, like going in there and just laying in on the other guy. The referee, of course, admonished him. But uh, that it, to me, that it, you know, if you if, if if it were a real fight, and I'm like on the apron, my tag team partner's in trouble, and if I don't do anything, we could lose the match. Hell yeah, I'm gonna go step in. Yeah, I'll take, I'll get chewed out by the referee. And they did that in this match multiple times. I absolutely just you know love that. I, uh, I think uh, just mm -hmm. I think more act more pro wrestling today needs to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean. Like Boom Boom said, if it was a real fight, why wouldn't if you're gonna lose, you might as well fight for that loss. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I find it to be uh, weird how much people follow the rules and older guys, you know, like right. a Jim Ross and a Jim Cornette's like, oh, you gotta have the tag rope. You can't just run in and out. But like in the '80s, this happened because they wanted to make it realistic. When it, who cares if you're gonna get disqualified? Go for it. I mean, if you're going to lose, you know, yeah, it's like, well, if I'm going to, okay, if I don't do anything, I may lose, but if I come in and interfere, I can at least, you know, you know, stall, stall the match for a few more minutes here. I mean, you know how silly Team Chaos looks? Team Chaos never helps each other out. They're not even a team. They're a bunch of idiots trying to sell expensive hats. And the second thing is, like, JR and Jim Cornette, oh, it doesn't make sense. Like, why wouldn't that make sense? If me and you... We're in a fight or a tag team match against Wrestling Ranton and, I don't know, SOS Wrestle Talk, okay? Mm -hmm. And Wrestling Ranton was beating the shit out of me, and you're like, oh, God, we might lose. Why wouldn't you go in the ring anyway? It's, what are you going to do? Are you disqualified? Oh, we lost anyway? It's better than sitting on your fat ass holding onto a rope. That's yeah, true. Uh, and eventually they, they started paired off with Yatsu and uh, Saruto on the inside. Tenru and, uh, Choshu, and Choshu on the outside. Uh, Jumbo started laying in some vicious lariats and even hooked up a, bro a Boston Crab. Uh, Datsu started taking the heat. He started getting double teamed. Uh, Choshu was trying to struggle to get back up from the beating he took on the outside. He eventually got the hot tag. He goes in there. 
against and just starts leaning to Saruta. He even locks in the Scorpion Deathlock. Uh, crowd is just chanting. They're losing it. Jumbo's selling it like a champion. Eventually it gets broken up. Yatsu has to come in. He actually, y- Yatsu actually hits a sling blade in the, in this. Uh, I just mentioned it because there's a, sometimes, there, you know, there's like spots they go, oh, that doesn't make sense. No, dude, they've been doing this stuff forever. It's just, we just haven't noticed it until now. Thank you, Internet. Uh, you know, Yatsu is just on top of Saruta, just ground and pound, just, I mean, just laying into him with some stiff punches. In fact, he busted him open and took him to the outside, threw him into the ring post, uh, brings him back in, hits a pile driver for a two, then hits a side of suplex for a two. Crowd's just losing it. Uh, Yatsu locks up, I guess I can best describe it as the Boston Crab on Saruta, and then uh, tries his own version of the uh, sharpshooter, and then Jinjiro, uh, Jinjiro uh, Tenru comes in and breaks up the pin. Uh, then Yatsu starts taking, I mean, he starts getting the shit beat out of him. Choshu and uh, Saruta brawl to the outside. Uh, there's several near falls right there. The referees lose control because as soon as one guy gets in trouble, the other partner's trying to come in. He's struggling. Uh, eventually, uh, Jinjiro Tenru hits a Ganzo bomb on uh, Yatsu, one, two, three, champions retain. Uh, you know what, Coco? I, I love this match. I love this match. You know why? Because there really wasn't a, like a lot of rest periods. Yes, like the athletes themselves did get some moments to rest, but there was constant fluidity. I mean, there was, you know, tags. They were brawling to the outside. They'd come back, you know, they'd get back in. They'd start fighting. Uh, you know, there was somebody coming in there to break up to break up any pin attempts. They, you know, the partner got in trouble, the other partner would come in. Referees trying to keep, you know, they, everything was moving. It just kept flowing. There was really no down moment. There was none of those moments where I'm like, you know, trying to check like the time. How much time have I got left in this match? No, never once did that happen. Uh, I think it was an amazing match. I I enjoyed it a lot. Um... I, I just think it's the it's the ultimate all Japan match. I said that um, while you were talking, I was just taking notes. So please just cut me off anytime you want to add something. Boom, boom. Okay. Once again, you're gonna. This is gonna be a dead horse that I will continue to beat. I am the beater of dead horses. Context is everything. The crowd is into it. Oh, I'm yeah. tired of the myth of oh Japanese fans. They're quiet. They're quiet because you're not over. <laughs> Period. Um, another thing that I like is that I get to see, uh, Riki Jusu in his prime. Um, he's a WWE Hall of Famer, pro wrestling Hall of Famer, one of the greats of all time. But when I started watching, he was past his prime. He was already a legend. You know what I mean? Like, oh, that guy. So it's great that we're doing this because I always feel like, you know, you see young YouTubers, you know, go back and try to do ECW, go back and try to do WCW. And they're kind of lost in the sauce, but not exactly know what's going on, but still trying to learn new things. I feel like that's how we are with these matches, you know, especially some of these early 80 matches. Um, I love the old school, eight, you know, all Japan ring. I just had nostalgic all over it. Um, I love the fact that the cameraman zoomed in on the tape ribs that they, even though it was in a different language, they still told a story. Like they made sure to slow down, be in certain spots, and the cameraman zoomed in on the ribs. I thought that was great. Uh, Scorpion Deathlock and Boom Booms talked about it a bunch. A lot of stuff. The Jim Cornettes, the Jim Rosses. Go back and watch it. A lot of these people are full of shit. A lot of these people are full of shit. And it's because they want to defend what they believe pro wrestling is. Um, Pile driver joke. Um, yeah, fucking. This is the first match that I didn't see like nine thousand pile drivers. I was like trying to have a count. And I was like, damn, there's a pile driver, but man, <laughs> it's not like the old days. And I find it funny that New Japan versus All Japan style. All Japan is these big broody guys beating the shit out of each other and bringing foreigners in to match it. Where New Japan is some of the best wrestling in the world. You know, that's the difference. You know, New Japan. But now, you know, throughout history, I wonder if they swapped. I wonder if New Japan is the one bringing in all the, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And all Japan. So I found that to be interesting. And I, I, I've seen so many all Japan matches that, like, I don't know if I would give this five stars. Not that I would rate matches. 
I just think I've seen this match way too many times. The thing I would like to say the best about this match, though, and Boom Boom touched up on it, was the timing. The timing was, you know what I mean, just fantastic. It was like it just kept going, you know? So I just think this was, you know what? I understand why he gave it five stars. It's the perfect All Japan match. And it's a great place to fucking be like, oh, what is this style of pro wrestling? Now, granted, All Japan is trying to shake this style a little bit to try to win over Japan. But yeah, um, at one time it was like New Japan has the best athletes. All Japan has the best uh, foreigners coming in while just athletes beat the piss out of each other. And I kind of wonder if that is swapping these days. But it's very interesting to see the history. Um, yeah, seeing Ricky in his prime, I think was the highlight for me. What was the highlight for you, Booms? Uh, the highlight for me was just the whole, like, it just made sense. Like, I, I'm, I'm going to keep harping back on it, but it was like one guy would get in trouble. His partner had no trouble going in, breaking up the pin, you know, and it, good guys, bad guys. It didn't matter. It was like, it was presented not like, you know, the evil invaders versus the, you know, the, you know, the heroic, you know, defending champions. No, it was just two different teams who wanted to win. That's all they wanted to do. They wanted to win. They, you know, they had the champions, wanted to keep their championships. The other team, they were the invaders. They wanted to beat, you know, they wanted to beat the champions, and they wanted to be, you know, the new champions, and they were going to do what they had to do, and their partner got in trouble. They went in there, and, and just, I loved it. They... One thing I noticed is they didn't get really flashy, but when they did get flashy, it just it was really impactful. Because one thing I've noticed is they would do like a lot of ground, like I mentioned, like a lot of chops, kicks, punches, round and pound. Uh, they would break up pins, and then when they would hit something like a pile driver or hit something like a cyto suplex or a ganzo bomb, it was just seemed even bigger when they did it because they didn't blow that right out the gate. And they they didn't go for the near falls in the early in the early going. So when they fought, there were some points in there when they went for some near falls that actually fooled the crowd. The crowd thought it was going to be three. So I, I love that. And you did answer one of my questions: is was, does, does the match still hold up? Yes, yes, it does. Do I think it deserves five stars? Absolutely. I, I think you could have this match today. Uh, put it on, you know, AEW, put it on WWE, put it on Impact, put it on Ring of Honor, and it would still hold up the crowd, you know, audience, you know, just, they wouldn't blink. It would be like, oh, this is still a good, this is a good tag team match. Oh, yeah. I think it holds up in all Japan. I don't know if it holds up in North America. I don't know. I guess it just depends if the story they you know i guess i think this holds up if it has the star power hmm. i think if you put four you know superstars in japan that people in america don't know it doesn't hold up i don't think it does um that and also dude it was weird seeing everyone uh dressed in all black bear friends like what is this young lions and um also just one more thing i forgot to add the trophy and the promo at the end, man, <laughs> that's just that's just a that's a staple. That is a staple. The big trophy and the promo. I'm gonna get revenge. What did they say at the end? Because I don't speak Japanese. They said subscribe, like, comment, <laughs> like, comment, <laughs> subscribe to Coco Sports. I don't know. I could ask Bear Friends to translate it, but I probably the gist of it is we'll get revenge. We'll be back. Come on our turf. You know, that's what they say 98.9% of the time. So, it's like one of those three. We'll get revenge. We have to have a rematch. You come to our company, you know. <laughs> so, I could be wrong, but that's my guess. Okay. Or, like, comment, subscribe to Coco Sports. Either one, I think. Share share the video with your friends. Well, man, that's really cool. Speaking about groundbreaking, this guy's plugging our YouTube channel. I'm just being an ass, but you guys get it. Uh, okay. um, so that was just, now. Here's the aftermath of this. Here, here's what would happen to all these competitors. For one, Jobo Saruda, he would go on to win the NWA uh, International Heavyweight Championship two more times. He would win it in October of that year, and then again in 1988. He would also win uh, the NWA International Tag Team Titles with Junichiro Tenru 
1987, and believe it or not, with uh, Yasu in 1988. Uh, he won the World's Strongest Tag League with uh, Yatsu in 1987, as well as the PWF Tag Team titles. And he would unite the PWF, the Pacific Wrestling Federation, the NWA United National Championship, and the NWA International uh, Heavyweight Championship, and form the, and basically put it together uh, in this was to become what is now known as the All Japan's Triple Crown Championship. He did that in April of 1989, and he also did it again in October of 89 and January of 1991. Uh, his so he was the first, you know, the big championship they have is technically All Japan's like, main championship is basically three titles they consolidated into one. That's why it's called the Triple Crown. Anyway, his. Uh, Saruta's career started winding down in 1992. Uh, he moved to, um, and he eventually retired in 1999. He moved to Portland, Oregon, where he went to the University of Portland at Oregon, and he got a bachelor's degree in uh, political science and a master's degree in coaching. Uh, then he would have some health issues. He contracted uh, hepatitis B, which lead, would lead to liver cancer and even cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, but due to the some of Japan, you know, he would tried to seek out treatment, but due to Japan's, I think I think it's like medical regulations or whatever, he was having a hard time finding a donor, but he did manage to find one in the Philippines and went there in May uh, for a transplant, but he would later pass away on May 13th in 2000 uh, of complications from that transplant surgery, and he passed away at the age of 49. Uh, his partner that matched Junichiro Tenru, he was the second ever a uh, triple crown championship uh, and he would win match in that uh, in I think he actually beat uh, Jumbo Saruta for that on June 5th 1989 which won of him uh, match of the year uh, for uh, 1989 he would also win it again in October of 2000 and then April of 2002 he actually pinned uh, Giant Baba in a tag team match and only him and Masawa are the only people to pin him and Anoki. So he's so he actually pinned uh, both Anoki and Baba, which is huge uh, during his career. Only Masawa did that. Who we've talked, to, who we've also had on the show here. Uh, he was the second ever Tiger Mask. He would be the he would be one third of the NWA Six Man Tag Team Titles uh, Champions. Excuse me, with the Road Warriors. He teamed with Koji uh, Kato, and they took on and defeated Demolition at WrestleMania 7 in 1991. Uh, him and Jumbo Saruta would be the NWA Tag Team uh, Champions in 1987. He would be the PWF Champion in 1988, uh, and he would compete in the 93 and 94 Royal, WWF Royal Rumbles. Uh, he would eventually leave uh, All Japan in uh, April of 1990 to form the Super World of Sports, and that lasted until... 1992, he was going to take part in Wrestling and Romance, better known as War. Uh, he returned to All Japan in 2000. Uh, that was after the great, there was a big exodus there in 2000, which is something we'll definitely have to cover on this show, but we'll get to that at a later date. He would eventually leave that in 2004. Uh, he would do uh, NOAA in 2005, Hustle, and then he retired against Kazuchika Okada in 2015 in a match that was named Match of the Year. On the other side of this, um, Ricky Chushu, uh, he would actually leave, he would have shut down uh, Japan Pro Wrestling in 1987 and he would return to New Japan and he became the, the IWGP Heavyweight Champion in July of 1989 when he beat Salman uh, Hosh. Hashimikov, uh, he was the Soviet there, and he would also have another. He would have another reign in 1990 and 1992. He swept the G1 in 1996, which, by the way, was done differently back then. I looked that up. There was only 10 men in there, so there were two two blocks of five, and he won one of those matches via medical forfeit. Not to, not to downplay it, but he wound up would win the. He would sweep his block in 96. Uh, in 1988, he had a brief retirement. And he wrestled when he wrestled five matches in one night, won four of them. Uh, he was the became the booker, but he came back to wrestle uh, Okuchi Onita in a death match in 2000. 
he had left um, left uh, New Japan again in 2002 when Muda, Muda and Kojima they left for all Japan, so they all left together. Uh, they would form uh, he would form the fighting the fighting world of Japan uh, pro wrestling in 2003, which is later renamed Ricky Pro. He again he would come back to New Japan in 2005. Uh, but he wound up retiring in a six-man tag match in June of uh, 2019 and had some bangers, man. He was named Best Booker in 1992, had a Match of the Year candidate with uh, Jinshiro Chinru in 1993 and Wrestler of the Year in 1987. Now, Yatsu, he would uh, go on to be uh, Joe Bosaru's partner, and they would form a tag team called the Olympics, and they would go on to be five-time tag team champions. He jumped to the Super World of Sports in 1990. He actually wrestled uh, Hulk Hogan unsuccessfully for uh, the WWF title. Uh, he would get diagnosed with diabetes in 1991. Uh, he would go on to form the Social Pro Wrestling Federation in 1992. He wrestled his final match in uh, 2010. Him and uh, they lost to Tatsumi. Him and his partner uh, Koji Ishim. Um, I'm sorry, I can't read my own handwriting there. They lost to Tatsumi Fujinami and Tiger Mask. He would come out of retirement in 2015, and he did a show in April 2019 with DDT, but he was done after that because in June, later on in June of 2019, uh, Yatsu had his right leg amputated due to complications from his diabetes. Um, that's... Uh, and then that's where these guys wound up uh, after this match. So it's a great part of history, and it's amazing we get to see it. Yeah, and um, I was always a big fan of the Triple Crown, and I'm glad I got this. I'm glad we're doing this, man. We get to see stuff that we only read about or knew. So it kind of makes me feel a little bit young, you know? So thank you, Boom Boom. Um, but, yeah, overall, you should definitely check it out. And if you like this match, please check out a lot of All Japan. This is a very All Japan heavy match. And yeah, they're, they're, they've done some amazing matches in this style. And it'd be great to see All Japan get some new fans. Because I was a huge All Japan guy back in the day. But it was ran very, uh, very poorly. But they're trying to make a comeback now. But I feel like it's not the same but still yeah booms do you have yeah, anything well, to add before we head out yeah we'll tell you why coming up later on in this series why all japan started to struggle like they did but you know that's going to be later on and uh coco you know i know we spent a lot of time in japan on this show here because i mean we up until up until this date right now we've only done one match that was in the united states so far but now we're going to go when we uh, do their next show here, we're going to go back to the state of Florida for our next match here. So, but that's going to be coming up in the next podcast. Yep, Florida and Japan, they rule all pro rest. <laughs> 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 they go back and forth, baby. Florida, Japan, Florida, Japan. Oh, man. All right, boom, boom. Thank you very much. Internet Infantry, love you with all my heart. Slowly but surely, we're rebuilding this. We got a couple shows in the can, so we're going to keep working hard. Like, comment, subscribe. Tell your friends that me and Boom Boom are still alive and trying to do shows again. Sometimes it's harder to revive a dead channel than it is to start new, but we're stubborn. We're stubborn and old, and this is a lot of fun going back in history, seeing people that you've not seen in their prime or seeing matches that you either don't remember or haven't seen. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, very interesting. And um, you can check me out every day at twitch.tv forward slash Coco Sports and pre-order my book, Lucky the Orphan. It's about growing up in the 80s as an orphan in New Jersey who would do anything for Nintendo. And Operation Freak Show is a very dark thriller. This is a, you know, lighthearted coming of age story. So love you guys. Boom, boom. Is there anything you want to add before we head out? Uh, check us out, Coco Sports. That's KOCOSports.com, Journal for Combat Sports, where the world goes to kick ass, most importantly, where it's okay to be a passionate fan. Also, be sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. You can also catch uh, Dave Coco over on Twitch TV, sports slash Coco Sports, again, KOCOSports, where he plays 
Uh, let's see, he plays basketball, hockey, uh, WWE, and Fall Guys poorly. You can make fun of him there. He's also got his own website, DaveCoco.com, where you can buy his Loser in Japan t-shirts and his aforementioned novels. So be sure to check it out. All right. Love you, brother. With that, 